All right, gang, I am super excited to have with me a guest, a musical composer, and his latest work is on 2023 Bell, which is out right now. Uh, the Beauty and the Beast saga is a thing that I am about to turn 40 in a couple months, so I've seen many iterations of, from the soap opera that was on my like, cable TV way back when, to straight up just uh disney series and this one is definitely a original take on a classic story and part of that is our guest uh, matt orenstein's work as the composer the score uh, really does convey the emotion of all the characters that are in it so welcome to the show man thanks jimmy um this movie like talk a little bit about the process before we get into the the actual process that you did like how did this project and you come together um i i've known the director max gold for a very long time we go way back and when i moved out to la we um you know we reconnected and we wound up working on his first movie together it was called silicon beach it is called silicon beach and then we really enjoyed working together so we did a pilot and then um we worked on a bunch of other stuff and i knew that he was making this this, this movie about this icelandic take on beauty and the beast um and i think originally he had talked about using an icelandic cast and crew um mm -hmm. including a composer and so when I read early drafts of it, I was just reading it as a friend and as somebody who's worked with them quite a bit. And um, so one day I was talking to him about it and I was just sort of innocently, you know, I wasn't angling for anything. I was like, so who are you thinking you're going to get to compose it? Because of course I'm interested, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, he was like, I was thinking you would do it. I was like, oh, <laughs> well, well, I'm not, I'm not Icelandic. Um, and, and he was like, okay, well, you know, we've worked to, I want you to come to Iceland. Um, I want you to come to Iceland and get it in your bones. And um, I mean, our working relationship is, is really solid, really great. And so, you know, I think, yeah, we both, we both love the work that the other one does. And um, so it's, I mean, it, it made sense. He just said, get it in your bones. I don't care if you get off the plane, breathe in the air, feel the soil and come back i want you to know what it feels like because it's something that you can't possibly understand until you've been there so i went i spent uh, a good 10 days there i went to a couple of the set locations i my goal was just kind of to stay out of the way and record nature sounds and observe and feel what it felt like to be there and um I went on some guided tours. I did some solo explorations. And then I came back and three months later, uh, let's see, I got back in August. I started working on the movie in February uh, or something like that of 2020. Um, no, it was, it was March. And I worked on it from March till December. Several iterations of the score. I probably wrote about three drafts. And... Um, yeah that's how the project came together and that's how i started working on it that is pretty rad there's not too many composers that i've interviewed where the director is telling the composer to come i mean to any location nonetheless across the world to get a feel to to translate that into their music so what was what were some of your like your takeaways of you know the culture the climate the area like what what did that trip do for you well for starters the air is scarily clean mm -hmm. coming from los angeles um so much so that when i came back to la my system couldn't really handle the shift from you know crystalline icelandic mm -hmm. air to the smog of la wow. uh, the air is clean the the sight lines are cleaner. There's no smog because a lot of the energy, you know, the energy is geothermal, so they don't burn nearly as much. Um, uh, but sight lines are cleaner, and I think 
I, I have no way of proving this, but the way that wind moves through air like this feels and sounds a little different than the way wind and air moves in Los Angeles. And that's significant because the most common sound you will hear in the natural soundscape in Iceland, or the most common sound that I heard as an outsider was wind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are these big empty spaces, both in urban areas and in nature. And the way that the wind moves is really, is really striking. So I, no matter what I did, I always wanted wind to be a part of the score, whether it was dialing in sounds on my synthesizers, you know, dialing up the noise generators, whether it was having the strings play in a certain way so that the, the sound was a little breathier, um, whether having the singers sing in a breathy sort of way, as opposed to a more forceful focused kind of way, mm -hmm. I want, however dense the melodic material got, I wanted there to be this kind of sense of emptiness and potential in the score. That is pretty deep to <laughs> the, uh, the air uh, thing. I, I can somewhat relate to, we went on like a two week, trip um uh, through vermont and oh. you get out to some of those remote locations and you know you get away from the sounds of traffic and you just kind of like you know meditate in a sense and the air there uh definitely you know sounded different just kind of being away from everything except you know naturality i guess and yeah. so i can imagine you know just seeing like pictures of iceland the the scale of scope of some of the the environments that that you know that the, they have out there is uh, pretty unimaginable i can imagine until you are there so yeah well i mean even being there they felt alien um it felt i, I had a friend who was in iceland before i was by about two weeks and he said that he described it to me as like being in Best Buy and looking at the 4K TVs and seeing mm -hmm. how clear 4K was. Yeah. It's like real life. Yeah. It felt there was just sort of this hyper, it was this kind of hyper real quality to the way everything, the way the nature looks. But it's also, it's beautiful, it's beautiful in a kind of unearthly and alien way. You know, it doesn't, it feels like you're on this planet, but you're not on this planet. I can't, I can't describe it. I mean, you know, there, um, I, there's like black deserts, there's um, glacial caves, there's these sort of, these really, really unbelievable landscapes. Yeah. Uh, so you're out there and um, watching them film the movie for part of it and this take on Beauty and the Be Beauty and the Beast, it, it is different than if you guys haven't watched it yet or come across this movie yet. It is a very much different story all the way down to like some of the the biggest and minute details. And one of the you know the coolest things I thought that they did right off of the get go is um, the beast. He is a beast, but it, like he is a tortured soul. And, um, you know, the horror aspect of this movie comes in a lot, too. With, he is tortured by not only this curse that he has, but everything that he's done and the, you know, the ghosts that kind of haunt him and the aesthetic that they chose with that. And I thought if you were going to remake this, because you know, you've got like everything from Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey to, uh, you know, all these Disney remakes that are like getting hot in the, the horror community right now. And for for you guys to, you know, take that story and steer it in the direction more, you know, to its roots almost, you know, the original um being, you know, Belle, I, I was going to say it was from uh, France, like a French village, but to, to tone it down and there is some magic, but everything felt very much grounded, um, board, like borderline believable, really, compared to what this world is like today anyway. Um, 
the the music that you did i know you mentioned um scoring to the nature of iceland but when you started to like see sequences come together and like get footage and you're starting to really get down and and write to it were there certain aspects to like bell that you wanted kind of like the music around her or beast like what were some of your key points that you were you were kind of drawn from um well a lot of it was just um i mean well for starters i didn't write anything until until i saw the movie Mm -hmm. i typically i do i do a lot of prep as i'm waiting for footage you know i'll read the script i'll talk to the director um this isn't my first time visiting well is it my first time no no it it wasn't my first time being on the set of something that i worked on Mm. and it also last i've done a i've done a couple features and a bunch of shorts since wrapping up bell um but in general i feel like if you're going to score a film my background is my background is I'm an instrumentalist. I'm trained as a bass player. I've worked as I've my, you know, I've worked as an instrumentalist since I was about nine mm. uh, in bars since I was 16, played in orchestras, all kinds of stuff. And for me, I just try to treat the, I treat the, the film the same way I treat sheet music. If I'm playing like a classical, mm. game, you know? um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go up there and play Beethoven's third without my bass part. You know, I'm not going to play it from memory. I'm not just going to make it up. Um, the sheet music is going to tell me what to play. And I think in a similar way, the film is going to tell me what to write. So um, I'm able to work fast generally once I get once I get footage. But um, I guess what I focused on was, I guess, I don't know. It sort of depended on the scene. I knew that there were through lines that we wanted to hit. I wanted to track each character individually. I wanted to feel like each character had their own theme, you know, their own kind of soundscape. But I also wanted to feel like that soundscape was a part of a larger whole. Mm. Um, And at the same time, you know, I I tried not to get too precious with it. If something wasn't working, you know, I'd I'd ax it. That's fine. Um, On the whole, though, I wanted to create the sense of something that felt similar in scale to the movie that you see. I didn't want to outsize the moment. I didn't want to have any sounds that felt like they might be out of place mm. in the story. Um, you know, hence the wind stuff. The wind stuff feels like it fits. Right. The, the synth patches have a sort of warmth to them that um, when I went back and thought about it, there's a reason that I picked probably each sound in the movie. I had to go through and think, does this work for our movie? Does it not? Um, so I guess there was no, I guess, yeah, overall, um, my goal is just to tie everything together and help lead the viewer to water and the director knows where the water is. That's, that's it. The, well, you said there before, um, not really seeing any footage or anything. Did you, is that typically how you like it? Do you like to not really see any film footage until the film is done or do you like do you like watching like the rough cut or anything or do you you want to see it like full like almost to the fine cut before any kind of music like where do you like to start coming in and seeing actual footage oh no i see the first cut i work from the first yeah yeah yeah. sorry i wasn't super clear about that yeah i mean what i mean is i don't work until i get that first cut or i don't write a note of music until i get that first cut got it Um, and uh, usually, yeah, no, I, I, I don't like to work without, without footage. Otherwise, I'm making a record, which is great and a lot of fun. But um, if that's not the job, then that's not the job. You know? Right, for sure. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the whole thing, too, with it being centered around a fairy tale, you did, mm-hmm. I thought, bring like a sort of uh, mysticism to the to the music as well have you ever done any kind of like i mean this is very fantasy horror movie but fantasy have you like ever gotten to like play around in that realm at all before this one 
That's a really good question. I'm trying to think. Um, I think the answer is probably no. <laughs> um, the, answer, yeah, the answer is probably no, but I mean, I've done sci-fi before. Mm. Uh, I've watched a lot of movies. like, And so whenever I watch a movie, I watch it. I watch it as a fan, but I also watch it as like a music nerd. So I'm always listening to the score and you know, being an instrumentalist and being a working musician for as long as I have and being a, a consumer of TV and, uh, and, and movie. And also I worked at a record store. Mm. Just like I've got, I've got really open ears. And so I feel like, I feel like I have a lot to draw from. So I felt like it was, even though I hadn't done fantasy or anything, I hadn't done fantasy before. Um, hitting the ground running was not um, was not tough. It's it's funny as in film school, the program that I was in is they made us um, take no matter what avenue we we were like at the end of graduation. I really want to be a blank, and they are like, "Well, cool. Guess what? You're going to learn everything. So you have an appreciation for everything." <laughs> and our music class, like, I mean, I I tapped out on a, being a musician at like eighth grade trumpet so the solution to that the solution to to that is they give you a vast library of like royalty free stuff and they're like you know pick your your music from this and then score your projects you know the best you can essentially yeah. and one of the the cool you know lectures and examples is that the professor would play us you know movie scenes from everything from Fast and the Furious to Casablanca, and then he would play it again without any music. And you don't appreciate music in cinema until you watch cinema without any music. Like the cin without music, cinema sucks. Honestly, because this like you need. And if you take if you go even further and you take full sound design out of it, like then it really is is rough to watch because the emotion of the actor really will take you to, you know, maybe a few feet in front of that ledge. But it is the score that will get you to drop over with the character, like in my opinion, anyway, like. If, uh, the, well, no, go, go ahead. I, I don't always agree with you. Um, I, I know exactly what you're saying, um, but I think there are a few really, really compelling of examples of how silence can work in movies, like how no, no score can be a powerful, the most powerful score. And I think in order to really appreciate what score does and what score can do, um, it's important to also recognize that silence is sometimes the best option. And I'm thinking of the birds. The birds is a great example. No score on the birds. Sure. Uh, uh, no country for old men. No score. Um, and uh, failsafe by Sidney Lumet. Uh, no, it's I've never seen that one. Nobody's seen that movie. It's crazy, but it's I'd, I'd really recommend it. It's um, I mean it's Sidney Sidney Lumet. It's uh, a Cold War movie that's sort of like a. It's a humorless Dr. Strangelove. That's the best way I can describe it. Okay. And you get that real, that real sense of dread. Um, and I mean, Bell, Bell was a very score forward movie, but I think we were also really intentional about what we wanted score to do, you know? Because it's not just any old score. I mean, those royalty free libraries will only get you so far. It's gotta be, it's gotta be the right score. And yeah. sometimes to your point, I think, um, sometimes silence is the is the right score, and that needs to be that that always needs to be an acceptable quiver, uh, arrow in a, in a composer's quiver. The it's interesting that you mentioned like the birds and No Country for Old Men because in you know trying to remember, especially Old Country, I'm a huge Hitchcock nerd. So the birds, I'm like, oh shit, he's right. Yeah, there isn't uh, Old Country. God, I I the Javier Bourdain walking down that highway. I, I need to rewatch that movie because imagining that scene with no score, like that's kind of creepy. Um, the whole movie is incredibly creepy. Yeah. 
if there is score it's it's minimal it's minimal enough but it's um yeah and i think i think if i think it opens you up if silence is is acceptable because it means that you start from a place of silence and then you sort of work out and you figure out exactly what you want the score to do and then when you get to that point you stop do you watch when you get start getting the cuts? Do you watch the whole thing start to finish, or do you you do? Yeah, yeah, I watch the whole thing start to finish. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm looking for spotting for what um, you know for what what we've all kind of decided. But I'm also thinking I'm also thinking to myself: Are there other places? I'm thinking more globally. Where where did the where did we reuse temp? You know. Mm -hmm. Where did we use the same piece of music more than once? And is there a reason that we did that other than functionality, other than just this is what we cut to? Mm -hmm. um, usually the answer, I think it's probably good to assume that it, it is more intentional and that there is some sort of a connection. So I think examining what temp we really considering what temp we're using and where um, by watching the cut straight down um helps me kind of formulate what I want the what I want the score to do and then of course you know the, I talk to the director I talk to the editor um we make sure we're on the same page being a bass musician at such a young age growing up did you see yourself transitioning into film did you think you were always just gonna stay in the music like what what was your kind of path to where you are now um I, uh, I wanted to be a rock star, um, <laughs> but you know, that, that didn't work out. Um, but it's, it's okay. I, you know, I don't really knew, I don't really know. Um, I think I knew I, I think if I, if I was really honest with myself, I knew I wanted to do something with music. I, I think I always knew that it was a hard way to make a living, but the older I got, the more it became clear. I just don't want to. You know, I didn't really want to do anything else that was outside of this world. Um, film, I I don't really know if I ever saw myself becoming a film composer until um, until probably I was in my early twenties. I kind of flirted with the idea, but I didn't I didn't really embrace it until I was in Chicago and I was working as a well backing up a sec when I was in college I was a performance major and then I realized I didn't want to just do performance and so I petitioned the conservatory to let me um to let me kind of just design my own path of study mm. and they let me do it um yeah Oberlin Oberlin Conservatory um yeah Marcy and Brian Allegant were, were super super great my teacher peter dominguez peter peter was my bass teacher and at one point i told him i didn't want to be a jazz major and he was like well there's you can do this this and this with the bass and then he turned it upside down like the whole instrument the head stuck on the floor the end pin was facing up and he was like do something with this <laughs> um so i had people encouraging me to think outside the box and kind of do what i wanted to do as long as there was some kind of um you know, as, as long as I was doing it well, and as long as there was some kind of rigor and what I wanted to do for the end project to put everything together was a film score for the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Oh, okay. Um, so I worked on that my senior year. I loved every minute of it. It was insane to, to put something together like that, but I did it. And then I just sort of, you know, I bounced around a little bit and wound up in Chicago um, a few months after graduation. And when I was there, I was, I was working as a bass player, record clerk, um, a music teacher, grocery driver. Um, and then I started scoring for, I started scoring for theater companies and for performance art and dance and stuff like that. And I realized I liked that. And I got a couple of film gigs, but nothing, um, nothing too high, pro nothing super high profile or anything like that. And I realized I liked writing for things that you could see. And that when I was at the record store, the things I was most excited about were the film scores, you know, mm. uh, horror film scores specifically. Um, the day that Rosemary's Baby came in, like the original press of Christoph Kamita, uh, I was very happy. 
Um, and I got a copy of like The Shining and The Exorcist and all these old Morricone scores to Argento movies that, you know, everybody talks about Goblin, but they forget that Morricone did some great scores for, for Argento. And the pieces started to kind of fit together that I wanted to write music for movies. So I moved out to LA in, in, uh, in early 2016 to pursue it. And um, I'm still here. Right on, man. You survived Corona, which... Yeah. Weirdly, I was, I was busy during Corona, which, which feels weird to say, but I mean, Bell kept me really busy. Right on. Lifeline. I mean, geez, things got real bad out in the world for a second. I mean, they're not great now, but I mean, when we were afraid to share airspace with, share space with people, sure. um, hot out right after George Floyd's murder, um, you know, um, it was just, you couldn't, you couldn't get away from this. Right. Um, and I couldn't work with the AC on in my apartment. So it was hot inside. The news was terrible. Oh man. Uh, Bell, Bell became, once I, once I really hit my stride with it, Bell felt like a lifeline. And if I'm, stand, if I'm here today, I think a large part of that has to do with the fact that working on Bell kept me busy and kept me sane. Right on. The the amount of people that have come on our show, I kind of say something similar to that, that they were filming or they had just wrapped filming before things got really bad. And then post-production work kept them, just like you said, kept them sane, gave them something to work on. Um, you know, our day, my wife and I, our day jobs were teachers and they, they shut down, you know, the school district and we did the whole distance learning thing. And the, the mental impact that that had on not just the adults, but like the kids of just like, you're not allowed to do anything. You're not allowed to, you know, really leave you. You're not supposed to really leave your house. Um, the, that messed a lot of people up, like, and then coming back and I mean, we had like full, you know, hazmat dividers in our classrooms and stuff. It was crazy. And yeah, the, the fact that uh, we did have the goal, which was, you know, teaching as best as we could versus you, you know, doing the best you could you know, scoring music. Like that really is, you know, something, you know, having a purpose to that got everybody who got through unscathed for the most part, I think, having that general purpose was definitely a key component during that time. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it helps a lot. Um, and then when it ended, it was a letdown, but I wound up doing another movie after it. And then, um, you know, yeah, but that was a, that was a really scary time and I'm really grateful to have had Bell. I don't know where I'd be without it. You mentioned you you dig a lot of horror uh, soundtracks and scores and stuff. And we talked before we uh, started recording about both of us having the love for Star Wars. Um, if you, if this may be too too tough of a question for you, but if you could do a top three of your composers that come to mind from everything to, you know, uh, John Williams to John Carpenter. What what would you say uh, are your uh, top three composers that you as as just a, a movie fan really dig? Um, can I give you film scores instead of composers? Sure. Because that question, I, I always, I, I definitely have two locked and loaded, and a third sort of rotates. Mm -hmm. But uh, my favorite film score ever is Blade Runner. Oh, nice. It's not close. Um, it's, it feels like it's coming from the world within the movie. For sure. And it supports the action so well. The first cut I saw was the final cut. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, the Harrison Ford narration is gone. It's super elliptical. Like he, it's like he barely says anything. Mm -hmm. um, the score is just doing so much of the heavy lifting. 
and it's so immersive that um i i just love it and that to me is the gold standard for film scores um my second favorite film score is probably the witch oh okay yeah 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 i love the witch mark corvin is a genius um it doesn't it doesn't feel like you're like any any movie i've ever seen it's it's folk horror, but it's folk horror done in the most like brilliant, gorgeous way. Yeah. And it's so, I mean, for starters, he uses period instruments and like period melodic conventions for, um, to do the score of this, this movie about this family who's got this sort of bleak, hard existence. And, um, it so works. And then, what he does with those instruments in making them sound abject and horrific, like the scene where um, the witch steals the baby and makes him into like a, a, a potion mm -hmm. beginning of the movie is one of the most haunting music cues. I think I've ever, I've ever seen. This is a creepy scene in general too. It's a creepy movie. I screamed when I saw it in theaters. Um, I saw it in, um, I, are, are you located in the LA area? uh northern like central valley okay i saw it in pasadena okay or, yeah I, pa pasadena or burbank and um i forget which but it was out there and um i it was like the middle of the day and i was with my friend rachel in the movie theater and we were like the only ones there and mm. there were a couple times that i, I really screamed <laughs> it's always the best to watch a horror movie in a movie theater and your group is the only group. Yeah. Like, yeah, for sure. And then um, my third favorite film score, you know, it might be Drive. Okay. Yeah, Cliff Martinez. Um, underrated I, movie. Underrated movie. I think, um, I think it imbues the movie with this kind of tenderness. Mm -hmm. It's not... I think it's it's funny because it's it's an interesting movie. It's fascinating because it was marketed as this kind of exciting, hard boiled action movie. Yeah. And then I went into the theater and it wasn't that. It was like it was suspenseful and it was but it was also kind of like gut wrenching and yeah difficult and you know, tugs at you. Um and you you it leaves you leave it leaves the theater with you in a way that um not a lot of movies do. So I think those three film scores, um, those three are kind of the gold standards. And then as far as composers, I mean, I like everybody that you would think that a film composer would like. I like John Williams. I like Bernard Herrmann. Um, I like Morricone. Um, yeah, I like uh, Hans. I, there's some Hans Zimmer stuff that really does it for me. Like mm -hmm. the color score is awesome. The Ludwig Gordson score, um, to Oppenheimer, I will be shocked if that does not win the Oscar. It's big and beautiful and it totally fits the movie. It's one of the best film scores I've ever heard. Um, yeah, I mean, you know. It was cool to watch him blow up when the when Mandalorian came out and he- Oh yeah. Showing the behind the scene footage of him, you know, coming up with all these different ways to make the sounds from that, iconic doo 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 and he's like this off. is it yeah. like yeah i you could tell he genuinely like was as excited to be doing the project and, you know fame or no fame like he was genuinely doing it because he was like so excited about what he was attached to not because mando was going to become this huge phenomenon um he was doing it for the love of composing, which is cool. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, I don't know if people talk about this a lot, but his Black Panther 2 score is out of this world. It's bananas. Um, I saw him talk about it at a, at a screening, and he talked about how he, for Namor's soundscape, he worked with a forensic musicologist um, to, it, like, talk about going deep. Like, yeah. that. That is incredible. Just looking at these, we don't know how Mayan music sounded, 
but looking at instruments that they dug up and um, figuring out where the indents were, were the deepest on like the flute holes so he could see what intervals they used the most and what, you know, ways that they got those sounds, ways that they hit the drums. Like that is, I mean, he's a, he's a great writer. He, um, he's a great writer, but the fact that he gets that much joy out of the research and he's that thorough is maybe the most impressive thing to me about him. Well, before we let you go, man, you did mention that you got some other stuff besides Bell in the works. What are they more horror projects or are you dipping into other genres? Like what what do you got going on? The big thing that um, the big thing that just happened is um, there's a film that premiered at Cinequest called Daddy that could not be more different than Bell. Um, yeah, couldn't be more different. I like getting to do a bunch of different stuff. It's fun for me. I mean the bass player in me is very happy because bass goes everywhere. And so if everybody needs bass, I get to do a bunch of different stuff, but yeah. this would be, um, it's about these, it just premiered at Cinequest. Um, I hope everybody gets to see it because I'm, I'm really proud of the movie that we made, but it's about these, uh, a not too distant future where you need to take a state mandated test to see if you are eligible or legally allowed by the state to have biological children. And the way that they test you is they send you to a retreat. Um, it's, it's kind of like a remote test. And so these four guys go to their retreat and there's nobody proctoring the test. There's no, they're not really sure what they have to do. And it's about everything that happens next. And it's a really funny and kind of frightening exploration of, of masculinity. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, Jonathan Sherman and Neil Kelly are the are the directors and writers. Um, and they did a really good job with it. So I hope that's something you all get to see soon. Yeah, that sounds like a really interesting premise. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty wild. Um, well, tell everybody, man, where they can kind of like keep track of your work and find you. Um, MattOrenstein.com. That's my website. Uh, O-R-E-N-S-T-E-I-N um, Matt underscore Orenstein on Insta Matt Orenstein spelled with a zero on Twitter because uh, there are other Matt Orensteins but none with a zero and uh, yeah yeah I mean those are the I think those are the spots um, I live in LA yeah <laughs> <laughs> well right on man again congratulations on Bell it was, it's a cool movie if you're watching or listening on the podcast, go check it out. You can find it right now. It's available on Amazon. Um, yeah. Like, thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, thank you. yeah, this was awesome. Super cool to talk to you. We will definitely have to have you back on down the line. Yeah, man. would love that.